So this is this is our last time together, right? It's our, our final lecture. So we should make a song. The final lecture. No. It's the final lecture. <laughs> All right. It's, so what I promised to talk about today is my vision of the future of manufacturing and the tools and the things that you need in order to be a part of that. Now, I truly believe that no matter why you decided to go to WPI, I truly believe that you're going to end up working for a business that does manufacturing at some point in your life. And that, that your job may be closely related to the, uh, to the manufacturing bit of it. So I think this is kind of an important topic because this is the time when you still have time to learn some things and bring them into those workplaces. Right? Who's a senior? All right. So you guys are out of luck. You're done learning now, right? Pretty much the D-term slide yes. coming in. Yep. Perfect. So... Um, a few years ago, I think it was Jay Black from Auburn University that, that put this forward. He said that the factory of the future would only have two employees. There would be a guard and there would be a dog. The guard's job was to feed the dog. And the dog's job was to make sure the guard didn't touch any of the damn machines. And, and so it's, it was, of course, it was a joke. The title of his book was The Factor of the Future. He wants to get people sucked in, right? But in reality, that exists today. There are parts of factories and there are parts of small machine shops where the processes run for extended periods of time. And we, we call it lights out machining, lights out manufacturing. So for extended periods of time, the process is just running and nobody has to be there to intervene. So it's not that far-fetched that in the factory of the future, there would be fewer employees per machine instance, let's say. I think, I think the, the whole guard and the dog thing, that might be a little bit over the top, but it's, it sort of sets a vision for us, and there's some really good reasons where part of that vision has to be true. I made myself note cards so I wouldn't forget about the things I wanted to say. But when I have my glasses on, I can't read the note cards. <laughs> when I have my glasses off, you guys are blurry. But um, so one of my favorite things to do in a machine shop is to press the green cycle start button and we'll walk away. Right. So it's that. It's that bit of being able to do the machining and have it happen without you that's important. <clears throat> but and before I get into the, the, the tools and the reasons why, I kind of wanted to share just a little bit about how I got to be in this place and why I've been able to form these opinions over time. I um, you know I was WPI alumni. I am a WPI alumni. If I was one, then I'd be dead right now. So I am a WPI alumni. Uh, I finished in 1995 on the seven-year track. No, six-year, sorry, six-year track. Might have been, it was close to the seven-year track. Um, went out, promptly lost five jobs in two and a half years. But in that time period, I um, <laughs> managed to buy some real estate investment properties. It turns out that real estate is very easy. It's just math and the math is not very hard. And so after two and a half years, five jobs, I realized that I was unemployable. I declared myself retired. I called it tuna fish retired. As long as all I want to do is eat tuna fish sandwiches, I had enough money. And then I got bored. And what do you do when you're 27, retired and bored? You go to grad school because you live a half a mile away. So, uh, so I came back to WPI and I just sort of lucked into a position in the manufacturing engineering program. It wasn't the one I wanted. I wanted to study uh, electrical engineering specifically. I wanted to study wireless networking and transmission. That was the field I wanted to go into. 
they uh, they looked at my transcript and said, well, you're a mechanical engineer and you barely graduated. I said, that's true. And they said, well, you can't study a master's degree in electrical engineering here because you're not, go take eight undergraduate classes in electrical engineering and pass them. And then we will consider your application or go to UMass. They said, you'd be accepted at UMass. <laughs> so I was kind of pissed off. I'm walking across the campus. I go to see my old MQP advisor. He had just become the head of the manufacturing engineering program here at WPI. And he said, well, you know, in our program, there's only four classes you have to take. Everything else is at the discretion of you and your advisor. You can take all those electrical engineering classes you want to and just get the degree to say manufacturing. I said, well, that's cool. Oh, and he had TA credits to give away. So it was free. And uh, I may have been retired, but I was broke too. So it, uh, it helped that it was free. So I came in, I started doing manufacturing. I still focused on doing my electronic stuff. And uh, in graduate school, they have required seminars. Any, anybody doing the MSBS and started going to their graduate seminars yet? Nobody yet? So they have required seminars. It's, it's very, um, what's the word, third grade? They pass around attendance lists. You have to be there. You can't graduate if you don't go to the seminars. It's kind of a pain. I was sitting in a seminar. It was about, I don't know, 100 yards that way in, uh, in Higgins. Some guy was droning on talking about something. And I had an epiphany. <laughs> and um, it was, uh, I mean, it, it changed the direction of my life. And I'm still on the vector that it set at that moment, sitting in that classroom, listening to some guy drone on about some research he was doing. No idea what he was talking about. Didn't matter. It was the moment that I realized that manufacturing makes everything. Right? It makes everything that makes our society happen. And so because of that, I started getting into this manufacturing degree and I really wanted to learn about manufacturing. So uh, it, it rambles on, it goes on forward. The, um, the school got in some new CNC machine tools. There was an opportunity for me to go get some training on those CNC machine tools. I thought that was pretty fun. I've talked a little bit about that through the class. And, uh, and then I finished my master's degree, became a consulting engineer in manufacturing engineering. Started working with big companies, little companies, and one of the companies I worked with was WPI. In exchange for a desk and a phone, I managed one of the laboratories. I didn't get a salary, but I got a desk, a phone, and a business card, so, which made it way easier to sell my consulting engineering because I had a business card that said WPI. So I'm sitting there, and the opportunity to take over the manufacturing labs teaching this class came up in 2006. So was that like 17 years ago, 18 years, somewhere in that range? So that day, oh, and they needed to hire somebody in a hurry. Class was starting in two weeks um, and they had not advertised the position. It's you know, typical upper management mistakes thinking, we'll just get somebody that already works here to teach the class. We won't need to hire anybody. So I said, you know, I can do this job. I will do it while you look for somebody. I'm guessing they haven't been looking real hard because they haven't replaced me yet. <laughs> or maybe they have replaced me and I just don't know. Um, but uh, I, I went through all that. And as doing that, when I started doing it, I said, well, I want to learn. I, I first, first lecture ever was in, what room was it in? Washburn 229. And I did not sleep the night before the lecture. I had talked in front of people before. I was not quite that introverted. But it was the first time that it was my class and I was responsible for it. And so was, I, I, as you can see now, I sleep before the lectures. In fact, I could probably fall asleep during one of my lectures. I have seen a faculty member do that in one of his lectures when I was speaking for a few minutes while he was sitting in the front row of the classroom, fell asleep. <clears throat> so anyways, so I've been doing this for a long time. As I did it, what I, what I started doing was seeing the needs in the industry, working with big multinational corporations and little startup companies and, and visualizing seeing what they needed. What I get calls for almost every day from all kinds of people around the country are, 
can you send us anybody that knows how to run a CNC machine tool? And they want somebody today that can go run that machine. And so to talk about what, what the needs are in the future, we got to kind of understand what the state of manufacturing is today. Um, so I just got this statistic off the internet. Must be true. It's written on the internet. By 2025, 22% of the current skilled manufacturing workforce will retire. That's two years away, right? By 2030, 2.1 million manufacturing jobs in the United States will be unfilled because we can't find people to do the jobs. So that's, we kind of need that factory of the future, don't we? We need the guard and the dog because these are the skilled jobs. So it's, it's, it's funny because a lot of people will say, well, I don't want my kids to go in manufacturing because those jobs are dirty. Right. And, and did any of your parents push you to, to have a career in manufacturing? Anyone? Nobody pushed you to have a career in manufacturing, except manufacturing makes everything that makes our world happen. So some people should be getting pushed to have a career in manufacturing. There's dirty jobs in manufacturing. Those jobs do not go unfilled. Those jobs are easy to fill. Hungry people get those jobs because they're dirty jobs that are low skilled. It's easy to fill those jobs. People that need to feed their kids go take those jobs. It's the higher skilled jobs that nobody can fill. It's the the being able to program the machine so that it, the dog and the guard can watch it work. It's being able to set up the robot so that it can feed the machine the parts so that the guard and the dog can go about their day. Those jobs are the ones that are not being filled. Those are important jobs. And, but technicians can do most of those jobs, right? You don't need to go to WPI to get that job. You can go to any technical college. They train people how to do that. They train people how to set up robots. They train people how to program CNC machine tools, how to operate the CAD software, the CAM software, how to set up the machines. So what does the workforce need from engineers then? It, um, it needs people that can train people off the street to go run the machines. If you can interact with those people, if you can, so, and one of the things we do in this class is we've, we've designed it, we're, we kind of selfishly designed this class. When you come back to do your MQP, it would be really nice for me if you already know how to do it, or at least you already know how to ask good questions about the steps you wanna do, right? So that's one of the reasons we focus on CNC machining in this class is because we expect when you come back to our lab to work on your MQP, you're going to want to do some CNC machining. And if I've at least taught you how to ask the right questions, when you ask for help on your project, the questions are going to be interesting to me. So that's kind of selfish. The other selfish thing that we've done in this class is we use it to recruit our future employees working in the labs, right? So have your, have your PLAs talk to you about the opportunity to sign up to become a PLA? I'm sure they have. Well, there's probably a few people that they whispered around instead of two. <laughs> but um, it's we do that because we can't 1,600 people a year use our facility to make something. We have two staff members plus me. So we couldn't possibly do that volume of activity without hiring students to come work in the class. One of the benefits of being one of those PLAs, and so yeah, I'm, I'm selling that right now. Sign up, be a PLA. But one of the benefits of doing that is you learn how to teach your peers how to use these kind of machines, right? So you're getting that skill set of being able to teach people how to do this. We used to do a program where we took long-term displaced workers. Um, we, we weren't allowed to call them unemployed. We had to call them long-term displaced workers. But we took these unemployed people. On the first day of the program, you knew why they were long-term displaced workers. There was no doubt about why the long term was there and the displaced worker. They would show up, we put them through an eight week program. At the end of that week, eight weeks, they would be a CNC operator. They would have some light programming skills and they would be able to do some basic setup on the CNC machine tools. In an eight week program, most, most places that do a program like that is like nine months. 
We did it in eight weeks. We put 450 people through that program. The government estimated the economic impact to the local economy was half a billion dollars by putting those people off unemployment into the job. We didn't get paid until they held the job for six months. So it wasn't just like, yep, yeah, we gave them some training. Here you go. Right. So we hired, we taught all of that with students like you. Right. So we hired you guys to teach those classes. And I've had several people that then hired those students out in the workforce tell me that this person that was one of your instructors in your program is two to three years ahead of any other out of college new hires that we've ever put in this position. So they're already past that. So you get those bonuses. So being able to take people, train them how to set up the machines, train them how to use the machines, train them how to do the programming, train them how to just be good employees. That's a skill that you're all gonna need to have when you get into the workforce. And that's not a skill that all of the big, there's, oh, there's manufacturing summits and there's people and they get CEOs talking and they get governors talking and, and all these people come in. That's not one of the things they talk about. They talk about training people, but they want schools to train people. It can't be that way. It's gotta be the companies that do the training. You gotta be able to hire somebody, train them, put them in a job. We need people who can do some of those higher level setup skills to do that, integrate the robot with the machine tool, to be able to know when it's appropriate to use a robot to do that machine tending and when it's better to have a low skilled worker do that machine tending. So I, I, teach, a, I teach a class in robotics and automation. One of the questions I ask the class over and over again is from management's perspective, what's the difference between automation and outsourcing? And so there is a difference, but it's something to consider because if all you want is to have the parts made, having somebody else make the parts might be the answer. So that's the thing, but, but being able to make those decisions, being able to communicate, you need to be able to make that engineering decision, decide that this is the correct choice, but you've got to sell that to management. They're not going to just do it because you're a smart engineer. You've got to convince them that it's the right choice. You've got to be able to speak their language. We talked in one of the lectures about techno babble buzzwords and, and jargon and stuff. You've got to be able to speak the engineering jargon, right? WPI is pretty good at teaching us to speak engineering jargon. You've got to be able to speak the shop floor jargon, the, the buzzwords, the things that the machinists say, right? You've also got to be able to step up and talk to the managers and explain to them what to do. You need to be able to lead both the people that work for you and the people you work for. So you lead in both directions here. So developing those skills will put you a step forward in the workplace. Let's see, training. Oh, some of you will still want to be designers, right? You don't want to do manufacturing. You want to wear the design hat, be the person that makes the decisions about what the product should look like as opposed to how to make the product. You have the hardest task perhaps. You have to start designing shit that's easy to make. Because when these 2.1 million people retire and can't replace their jobs, all the knowledge they had about doing stuff is gone. It doesn't stay. The, the institutional knowledge does not stay in that business. It walks out the door with the employees every night at five o'clock. And when they retire and they don't come back, that knowledge is gone. There is stuff that we did in order to send, you know, send spaceships to the moon that we can't do anymore. You know, we sent those first rockets to the moon pretty much without CNC machine tools. Now, CNC machine tools makes it so we can make more complex parts faster, right? But we've lost a lot of basic skills because the people that knew those skills, they don't work there anymore. Nobody collected that knowledge. It's gone. It's like, um, it's possibly the downfall of our civilization. The fact that we're losing this knowledge without without having a mechanism to collect it. So you guys that are designers need to be able to design shit that we can make and that, that the manufacturing people can train somebody that doesn't know how to use the machine to make it. We did an MQP a couple of years ago with a company that does, um, well, they make components for fuel injection systems. So they made uh, for, I think their customer was Bosch in this case. They're making components for a Bosch system 
for a particular experimental BMW vehicle. It was um, it was a gasoline engine, and the fuel injectors were running at 6,000 PSI. They considered any fuel leak to be a thermal event at 6,000 PSI with gasoline. Um, and so they're making these fancy parts for this test engine. I don't, I don't think it ever went into production. Uh, but diesel engines run at 35,000 PSI all the time. So it's just not quite as explosive when it leaks. They needed, what the MQP was doing is they had a book, a paper book. And when the part looks sort of like this, turn this knob a little bit this way. That's what the book did. It was, a, it was the training and operations manual for their staff that ran these million dollar grinding machine, $50,000 grinding wheel, little fancy parts coming out the end. We, would, we converted that to be like an HTML live document so that you could flip through it faster at the machine tool. That was the MQP. We didn't figure any fundamental manufacturing stuff out. But when they proposed this project, I said, well, don't your operators just kind of know what to do? Right? I mean, they've, they've been doing this for a while. They see the part. They know which direction to turn the knob after practice. Right? Practice makes things like that automatic. He said, they're all temps. They couldn't keep operators. Everybody, million dollar machine tool, $50,000 grinding wheel operated by a temp with a little HTML document that tells them which way to turn the knobs, right? You need to be able to design stuff so that that guy can make it because we're not putting that many skilled operators out there anymore. Now, of course, there's going to be highly skilled things. There's going to be people that have to make fancy stuff, right? We're still going to be building satellites and sending people to Mars and all that stuff. We still have to do those fancy things. But for general general day-to-day -day stuff, you keep those designs simple and easily manufactured. And so those are the things that I think if companies can't hire people that have those skills, the companies will fail. So those companies will cease to exist if they can't hire people with those skills. So those are the skills that I think will help you get a job, but also help your company not fail. Um, there's one more topic that doesn't get covered often enough that I, that I think is important to go into. So 70% of all manufacturing in the United States happens at businesses with less than 50 employees. Most manufacturing happens at small businesses in the US. Don't have a hard statistic on this. Based on my personal research, in the Northeast United States, looking at machine shops that are businesses that primarily do CNC machining. I would say that 70% of those businesses are owned by somebody who's between 65 and 72 years old. Those people need to retire too. The way they fail, and I've watched hundreds of them fail, the way they fail is that person gets older every year, right? Happens. It's hard to not do, right? They, that person gets older every year. Their kids have a career. Their kids aren't taking over the business. It used to be you'd pass this down generation to generation. There'd be like five years, five generations in a row would run the same business. No, the kids already have a career. The kid's a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. Who, who knows what their kid's doing? Um, one of the companies I researched is kids in jail. Um, I didn't bring that up when I met with them <laughs> for murder. It was a big yeah. deal <laughs> for murdering. It. Well, anyway, <laughs> the internet's a pretty scary place. You can learn a lot about people with free search engine stuff. Um, anyways, those people, they don't have an exit strategy. They don't have a plan for where to go. And what happens is when their employees start retiring, their employees are all the same age as them. When their employees start retiring, they don't replace them. When the machines start wearing out, they don't replace them. When customers go somewhere else, they don't replace them. And it ends up being a room full of old machines, an old guy and two customers. And the only reasons those two customers still do business with the old guy is because they always have. They, and, and as soon as he's not part of the equation, 
They're going to put that out to bid. Somebody else is going to get that work. The work still exists. The work's all going somewhere. But those businesses, they just slowly, it's like when you leave the apple on the tree too long and it just slowly shrinks and finally it falls off. Right. So that's what happens to most of those businesses. And that's bad. It's bad for the local economy. So the other thing I know about these 70 percent, these small businesses that do this manufacturing. Uh, so when we when we do accounting for a manufacturing business, one of the things that's really important to us is called the cost of goods. And so when we sell something, right, we, we sell it, we get some revenue from selling it. So the cost of goods is what exactly did it take to make that thing that we sold? Now we said we're doing manufacturing because we want to make stuff with the intent of selling it. The cost of goods are the things that are directly allocated towards the cost of making the thing that we sold. So it doesn't include things like paying for the CEO's new car. It doesn't, pay, it doesn't include things for paying for lawyers and stuff like that. It just includes the stuff that it takes to make the part. In almost every business that I've looked at, 50% of the cost of goods goes as direct salary to the people that did the work. So the people that did the work get 50% of the... So the only way we create new wealth is by adding value, right? We can go dig it up out of the ground, we can find it, we can trade for it, or we can add value to stuff and create wealth that didn't exist before. 50% of that new wealth that didn't exist before goes to the people that did the work. They then take that salary that they got, they go to the local restaurants, they go to the local grocery stores, they keep their local community solid and has new wealth coming in. If all we do is trade wealth back and forth, there's people that are really good at it, it all goes to the top. Right, we see this, we see people protesting in Central Park and all this stuff, complaining about 1% and everything. It's because they're only envisioning the fact that people are collecting wealth at the top. If we keep making it at the bottom, it flows through us and we still get to have a good standard of living. We still get to live in a nice community. Those businesses are out there in those communities. If they become one large corporation somewhere and there's a guard and a dog and everything is fully automated, I mean, the technology is there to do it. Over the next 50, 60 years, that kind of thing can happen. And then we're all gonna be screwed because all of our towns are gonna go away. So some of you need to go be engineers, do good design work. Some of you need to go be manufacturing engineers, help people learn how to do the manufacturing, run those things. Some of you need to become entrepreneurial and go out, get a job at one of these companies, with the intent of buying the owner out over some period of time. So that's my, my charge to you as people that have the ability to do this. You all have the technical skills to do it. The math is harder than real estate. Real estate, the math is wicked easy. Charge more for rent than it costs to own the building. You make money. It's a little bit harder because there's more complex nuances but, but I charge you to think about that sometime in your future. Not, not next week, not next year. My, my wife and I looked at this and realized that it's a huge problem. And so we, this is why I know so much about the local businesses. We're actively out there looking at them and buying them and we wanna buy a hundred in the next 10 years. So that's my thoughts on the future of manufacturing. What do you guys got? Questions? Any advice on where to start with real estate? Um, location, location, location. <clears throat> um, starting, so, all right, so we plat the market plateaued, starting to ease back down a little bit. Um, I don't think, so where to start as in what city to start in? or how to become, how to, how to get started, how to get started, find somebody that's investing in real estate and offer to help them offer to be their gopher offer to go to meetings with them and just help out find a mentor. Cause then you'll be in the meeting when you see them talking to people and how they get their money. We bought, we bought a bunch of real estate. I only ever made a $3,000 down payment. It was the first one I bought 
after that, everything was 100% financed. So, so it's out there, but um, and don't wait to start. Also, life advice: when you graduate, live like a student for as long as you can stand it. When I when I was 27 and retired, I still had roommates. I was living like a student. I lived in a three decker on Highland Street. Had roommates in the apartment that I owned the building. Didn't tell any other other tenants I owned the building. <laughs> I told them that I managed the building and when they wanted to get a discount in the rent, I said, well, I'll have to go talk to the owner. Because <laughs> right? you, you live in the same building with them, right? The building manager lives upstairs is one thing. The owner lives upstairs. You expect different things, right? <laughs> um, but uh, live like a student for as long as you can stand it. Don't borrow money for anything that doesn't come with a full basement. Don't pay more for a car than you can make in a month. And I know that one's tough, especially with signing bonuses and, oh, they always give you good car deals. They, just, they, they want to give you 90 days with no payments on that new car right after you graduate college. That one's a, that was a tough one to avoid. Um, I have a friend that when he was making $100,000 a month managing real estate, he was driving a leased Camry. So don't waste money on frivolous things. Anything else? Who's going to go get a job in manufacturing now? <laughs> Did you have a question or are you going to get a job? Oh, I have a job you already have a job in manufacturing. Yep. Where and where? Amazon Robotics. Amazon Robotics. There's a, um, I heard about, I haven't read it and I don't know what the name of the book is, but I heard there's this, really cool science fiction book. If anybody knows the title, tell me um, where it's like the end of the world doomsday situation, but there was an automated like Amazon warehouse somewhere that still had power. It was still doing automated deliveries to this town. And so the stuff was just all being made in that factory. I guess the garden, the dog probably died already, but, um, but this town just kept getting these automated deliveries. Anybody know what that book is? No, me neither. I heard that it exists though. I thought that would be a really cool book to read. All right. Outstanding. So the things that are left to clean up in the class, uh, I think most everybody's done their lab exam and done their assembly of their engine. There may still be a few people. Um, if you crashed during your lab exam or for some other reason failed your lab exam, we want you to do it again. It's like the driving test, right? It's not that you get one shot and you're done. We want you to pass it. We want you to get through it. Um, and um, what do we got? We got three questions. Three questions that should be on a final exam for this class and the answers to those questions. So the assignment for that is up. I also put up a new assignment for the project final, the, the final group project thing just for the document so that I can just collect them all in one place. Um, so what does it do tomorrow? I'll try to get grades out by end of the weekend in Canvas so that if you have a question about your grade, you can question me before the grade submission deadline is on the other system. So we get all those things fixed before I have to go do grade changes. Everybody's gonna do fine. I have faith. All right. I'm done. Unless you guys have more.